right, let's let's begin in prayer. That makes my brain work much better. <laughs> Probably yours too. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to look at your word. That as we carefully look at the word of God and the preciseness of truth that it holds about the Savior, his birth, his death, his resurrection, his life, that it would motivate us to serve him even more when we see the certainty of these things. Unite, Father, to hear and to listen and to honor what we hear in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Now, in front of you, we have, we've been, we we're going to get through this thing with the virgin birth today. We're going to finish. But just in way of review, we mentioned that Jewish scribes, modern Jewish scribes, and uh, liberal Protestant, uh, actually that gets a liberal, I don't know if you call them Protestant anymore, but uh, scholars uh, try to negate the virgin birth by using, by saying if, if Isaiah really was speaking about a virgin birth, he would have used this word, the Tula. And he did not. On your boards, write the word that Isaiah did use to describe the virgin birth. What did he call the virgin? What was a Hebrew word? It's going to be a one review question. Good, I got one person who got it. Now, anybody else? Two. Anybody else? Three. Oh, your brains are beginning to kick in here. Those three were answered. What's our word? Alma. Okay. That's an easy word for me because I used to be a Spanish teacher. Alma means soul in Spanish. Here it means virgin. I'm used to an Alma. Is the same spelling? I'm used to that word. So, uh, and this is really the review of why Batula, just in one slide, why it is not a better word for virgin. It is true that most of the times you see Batula, it signifies a virgin. That is true. But there are three exceptions that let us know that the word also had a general use in the scriptures and could also just mean a young woman and not a virgin at all. And they are listed here. The text states, um, let's see, uh, I'm going to start here. Yet in Genesis 24, 16, Rebecca is described as a beautiful woman and a betula. The text states that no man had known Rebecca that has had sexual relations with her. The point is this. If Betula was a standalone word that always meant virgin, you would not have to add that. You would have to not you would you would not have to say that, that had no sexual relations. You wouldn't have to mention that. It's in the word. And so what the writer of Genesis is doing, which I believe is, is, is Moses, is the writer of this thing. Is he saying, well, I know Batula means virgin, but sometimes they use it for just a young woman, so I want to make sure who she is. So that it has a general use and a more specific use. And then there's a second place in the scriptures. This is from the book of Judges. In 21.12, it says there were 400 Batula, or virgins. And again, it says that, no, that, that, that had no, no man lying with any male. Well, why is that put in there? So that you're sure it's a virgin. Which means the word alone does not assure of that because it has a more general use. And then there's the third mention where a Batula is not a virgin at all. In Joel 1.8, the Lord describes a Batula mourning for the husband of her youth. She's a widow. A widow is not a virgin. So, this tells us that Batula is not a better word. Isaiah could have used Batula. Generally speaking, usually it means virgin. But there's no, there's no exception to Alma. When you use the word Alma, it either infers virginity or it makes it 100% uh, for sure the way it's used. Okay? And if you will, the fault is not with Isaiah, his writing is a divine inspiration. It's that maybe the, the, this is the best Hebrew word that you could, almost the best Hebrew word that you could use. There is no better one. The tool is not a better one. We showed you that. 
So it's using the best word possible in the language. This is not an unusual thing in the Bible. Some of you who are students of the New Testament know that the word grace in secular literature and grace in the scriptures have, a, have, a, have a, a good deal different meaning. It was the best word God could use, so he used it and then defined it in the scriptures for what he means by it. And so you have to look at that. You have to also look, how is the word used in secular language? How is it used in the scriptures? Because often, this is the best word we have. I'll define it in the scriptures so you know exactly what I mean. And that's, that's how to, you know, how is the word used in the Bible? So when I, when I did the research on this, I looked up every single time, there's seven of them, Alma is used in the scriptures to really see if it's a better word. And, and we looked at those last week. Okay? Biblical research and study is slow. <laughs> the best way to do it is to be thorough. And, you know, I remember when I was studying the doctrine of predestination, I went through every single place in the Bible where it says someone's heart was hardened. And when I had done that, it became clear what was going on. But there were 30 of them or 40 of them. And people just don't do that. They take this commentary or what this person says instead of actually saying, okay, let's find this word every time it's used in the Bible and see how it's used. Yeah. All right. Turn your cell phones off. Forget about Facebook that day. You know, uh, uh, you know dig in the book. And I'm encouraging you to do that when you study something out because uh, a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. Remember that proverb? A thorough knowledge of something is not dangerous, it's very sure. And that's what we want to do. We want to do, no, we're playing games, I surmise something, not just take someone's opinion. And also, when I read some of my favorite scholars, I don't trust them. He said, well, why is that? I don't know, I, I don't know. I, I want to see it for myself. So when they say it, then I go looking for what they said is true to see if it's really true. I don't trust them. <laughs> And then, I'm not saying, well, you know, uh, uh, Frukenbaum said, or Zodiati said, I says, I check Zodiati and Frukenbaum out, and they're right. I check every place in the Bible, it's there. It's, you know, I'm a nutcase when I want to see something. I'm like, I want to find it for sure. You know, I get crazy. But I would encourage you to do that when you study things in the Bible. You're, when you find it yourself, oh, I got it. Yes, yes. And, and you'll, you'll speak about it with more conviction. All right. Now, we're going to move along from there. There's a few other points in this scripture that we haven't looked at. I'm going to skip through some slides here. Some of this is review. We know it. Hopefully. <laughs> Let's see. There's all the... Okay. Okay. Now... Just so we see what's going on here. I mentioned that in English we don't have a U plural and a U singular. Most languages do, they distinguish. So in Hebrew they do distinguish, and what it shows, this is a little bit of review, but it's important, is that when in Isaiah 7 8, uh, he is speaking, he goes back and forth speaking to. Uh, Ahaz the king, and then speaking to the whole house of David. And, it's, and that's when he goes from the U singular to the U plural. So let's look here. Uh, in verse 13, the switch takes place. He has made an offer to Ahaz. We call it a blank check uh, offer. Any sign you want, I'll, if you don't believe me, then I'm really going to take care of the kingdoms, the, these two armies that have besieged your city. I'll give you a sign in the heavens, I'll give you a sign in the sea, whatever you want. Ahaz turns it down. We mentioned that we have blank check promises in the New Testament. Things God has promised us and we never bother to take them up on. Me too. So Ahaz may look real dumb, but we can be just as dumb if we don't grab hold of the promises of God and go after them. But he switches to you plural, and then he says, Then he said, Hear ye, O house of David. If you did not know the difference in the Hebrew between a U singular and a U plural, that alone tells you he's no longer speaking to just Ahaz. He's speaking to the whole house of David. Ahaz turned down his sign. Now he's going to give a sign to the house of David. 
interesting enough, most of the house of David will also turn down the sign that they give them. The Lord Jesus Christ to his virgin birth. <laughs> if you read in the in the uh, Talmuds of the Jews, uh, they make fun of him of, 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 of you know, he's, basically they come right out, they call him a bastard at times. Say, so, well, you know, his father was this Roman, this and that, you know, discounting the virgin birth. And Jews believe that to this day. Now, obviously, the first the apostles were Jews. Many Jews realized because of the character, the way he lived, he was not just a human being. They understood it. But, uh, so he's speaking to the house of David here. And in verse 14, he says, Therefore the Lord himself give you, plural, a sign. You, the whole house of David, I'm going to give you a sign. And here it is. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And there's some obvious things here. Behold, in the Hebrew means, please, please, listen. <laughs> That's what he's saying. There are no exclamation marks in the Hebrew or the Greek. So the word behold serves like an exclamation mark. Important. Pay attention. Get this. Behold. Please, please listen to me now. That's what he's saying here. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. If you translate this as young woman instead of virgin, it's not a sign. He says behold. I give you a sign. A sign has to be unusual. It might be miraculous or just, how do I say it, something that like really catches your attention. <coughs> Women have babies all the time. This is, this is not a sign. This is, this is a normal miracle. I mean, anytime you hold a new infant, you have a miracle in your arms. But that's not a sign because it happens every day. A sign is something usual that does not happen. So, to, and one of the definitions I looked at for Alma says, context will tell you if it's a young woman or a virgin. Well, the context here demand a sign. And of course, if it's a virgin birth, we've got a sign. Interesting enough, think of the Jewish nation. How did it begin? With the birth of what? Abraham's son? What? Who, 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 did, who, who did the Judaism go through? Abraham's son who? Isaac. And was Isaac a sign? Well, his mother was 91 and his father was 100. It was a sign. So Judaism itself began through a sign. And so the Messiah that comes through Judaism will also come through a sign. Something has to be unusual about the birth. In this case, it's not the age of the mother. It's the fact that there is no male seed, just a female seed. It's a virgin birth. Okay, so without any, you know, grasp of the Hebrew, we need a sign here. A virgin birth gives us that sign. Uh, and of course, the second thing is, if it's just a normal birth, then it's not Emmanuel. Emmanuel literally means God with us. But if a virgin is overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, as we're told the Gospel of Luke, and conceives, then God is with us through with this virgin birth. So it just all fits that way, the whole thing. The Emmanuel, the behold, uh, the sign, the virgin. Okay. Now, we move on from there. And one other point, uh, let's see. Okay. Verse 15 and 16. There is a change here. He is switching from speaking to the whole house of David, and he is going back speaking to Ahaz. And I'll show you why that we know that's true. Curds and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Now, what's going on here is, what's the name of, a, of, I, of uh, Isaiah's son that he brought with him, folks? Sheer Joshua. Sheer Joshua. Okay. Sheer Joshua is a toddler. That's what we surmise from this. He does not know how to, how, to, how to choose the good and refuse the evil. Now I learned, when I was a kid, I had a younger brother, a year younger than me, and he used to like to eat dirt. And it wasn't, you know, what do babies do with everything? Goes in their what? In their mouth. And at some point they get old enough so they learn how to choose the good and refuse the evil. But, you know, I got a picture of him in diapers as like a, you know, one and a half year old. He, he's feasting on dirt. 
uh, you know, we take him to the beach and he's having a good time. You know, but, so what he's saying is, Ahaz, before Sheer Joshua is old enough to discern good from evil and what to stick in his mouth and not, okay? And actually, and you have four or five year olds that put some very strange things in their mouths? Yes, yeah, so you could. Some of you could tell stories, right? Emergency room stories. Yeah, I, I know how it goes. But anyways, so before he can do that, something's going to happen. So curse and honey, he shall eat. That he shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Be before the child. We're going to talk about why I've emphasized that here. The child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good. The land that you singular. He's speaking to Ahaz, singular, no longer to the whole house of David. The whole house of David is going to get their sight fulfilled in the future, 700 years in the future. But Ahaz, is, he, he refused the blank check offer. The sign in the heavens, the sign in the, in, the, in, the, in the deep. So God is giving him a second sign. The sign is, before my son, uh, Sheer Joshua, is old enough to discern between good and evil, what he should eat and what he should not eat, these two kings that you're worried about will no longer be there. And uh, I looked this up in, let's see, um, a Bible commentary. Knowledge Bible commentary. Bible knowledge commentary. And they said a year and a half later, both those kings were dead. That's, and they gave the year of the, the, the references for him. So, that's what he's trying to tell them. So, interesting. Ahaz turns down the first sign and God gives him what? A second son. Now the other thing I ask you, do you know any other prophet who was told to take a son with him when he did his prophesy? Anywhere in the scriptures? Okay, I know of none. If you come up one, tell me. Okay, I guess some of you are running it through your mind. I can't think of any. So we surmise there's a reason for it. Now, you notice it says the child. In the same way that above it says the virgin. I'm going to see if I, I let me show my notes what that means. Okay, uh, that's that's the mention of going back here. I have it here somewhere here. Okay. All right, I mentioned this last week. Behold, here draws attention to the event used in the Hebrew present participle. It always refu refers to a future event. So the behold is letting you know this is something that's going to happen in the future. But the sign for Ahaz is going to happen right now. All right. That's one I haven't checked up. I'm not so good on my Hebrew to do that. Maybe Matthew could do that for me. Would you check that that's, that is really a, a present, participle, future event? Matt knows enough Hebrew so he can dig into that. Thank you, Matt. Okay. Remember I told you I don't trust these guys when they tell me these things I want. I want a second witness and everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, all right. Two places here. We have the virgin and we have the child. There's a rule, there's the, now, the rules of Hebrew grammar here for this. According to the rules of Hebrew grammar, when finding the use of a definite article, that is the, if you say A, we don't know exactly which one the is a specific one, the definite article, the reader should look for reference in the immediate previous context. It's a clue in Hebrew to look in a context for something about the virgin being said or something about the child already being said. All right? Having followed the passage from, from chapter 7, verse 1, there's been no mention of any woman. Okay? Then, we, if that rule does not fit, there's no mention of a woman. The virgin, there's no mention of any other woman in that passage. So, Having failed the immediate context, the second rule is the principle of previous reference. Something which has been dealt with much earlier and is common knowledge among the people. Meaning, somewhere in the scriptures, this has been discussed before, and you've all heard it before. So, the question is now, we'll go on with this thought here. So, where else in the Old Testament is there a well-known passage referring to a virgin birth? There, are, I'll give you a clue. There is only one. Write it on your board if you know what it is. There's only one other scripture that really refers to a virgin birth that had already been given to the Jewish people that was common knowledge. What is it? 
If you don't know the verse, you can give me a couple words to describe what's going on. Okay. Let's see if anybody's got it here. I'm going to show it to you and you're all going to go, oh, I know that. Yeah, look at that. Okay. Ramo's working back there. Josh is working on this. I'm going to give him a minute to find it. Let's see what they come up with. <laughs> Previous reference to a virgin birth in the scriptures. Alright, let's go on ahead. Genesis 3.15. Oh, yes. 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 Genesis 3.15. Yeah, yeah, okay. Genesis 3.15. Alright, now. Well, I was reading it, but it doesn't uh, say virgin. Okay. Well, <laughs> what do we got here? We have Eve. You and the woman will be enemies of your offspring in the world. Right? And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, Eve figured this meant, well, yeah, it's going to be my seed, but it's also going to be my husband's seed. But it doesn't say that. It just says the seed of the woman. Right? And if this one who is going to bruise the seed of the serpent is of the seed of the woman, then he's virgin born. That's the only way it can be, only be seed of the woman. So, <laughs> yeah. The Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Now, what do you think he thinks of this serpent? What does she want to do to him? Death. Yeah, death. death. And here it is. Here's how she names. She has her first son. It's the seed of the woman. She thinks he's a messiah. And she actually says so. So I'm going to show you that here. Uh, did I? Let me see. No. Okay. No, I did not. I have it here somewhere. Oh. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. All right. The key note of this verse is the statement seed of the woman. In of itself, the statement may not seem unusual, but the context a bit but uh, so they're not context in biblical teaching. It is most unusual. Throughout the Hebrew scripture, lineage was never reckoned after the woman, but after the man. In all the genealogies we have in the biblical record, women are virtually ignored because they are unimportant to determining genealogy. Obviously they're important, you can't have the birth without them. But genealogies are all reckoned by male names. So when he says the seed of the woman, it does not fit Hebrew tradition. Something's different going on here. So the way we look at it, it doesn't look unusual at all. Why is he reckoning the seed after the woman? You always reckon the seed after the man in all genealogies in Hebrew. So he's giving us a clue. A clue. So those are our two verses on the virgin birth. Now, Eve thought this was all messianic. Some of you have heard me talk about this before. Uh, let me give you some other references here. In that, that this verse was taken to be messianic is clear from the Targums of Jonathan and the Jerusalem Targums. These are, you know, we may not have a whole document, we have portions of it. And from them we know which verses the ancient Jews considered to be messianic. They understood Genesis 3.15 to be messianic. They understood a virgin birth and wrote about it. So this is not a new thing that you know first century Christian concocted. This is an old Jewish tradition. For thousands of years, the Jews believed in a virgin birth. And that's why when Isaiah says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth the son, his name shall be Emmanuel, they get to the Septuagint in 250 BC, about 250 BC, they they translated Parthenos in Greek virgin. Because they've always believed in that, yes. When you get to chapter 4 of Genesis 2, you have um, in chapter 4, yes. in chapter 4 of Genesis, Eve names 
That's what I'm going to do next. Okay. His name. Okay. You're ahead of me. Ah, I know what I'm going to teach you for. Huh? I've seen this before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I want to see it on my thing here. I know what. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, let's look at it here. We mentioned Jewish people. Okay. I don't, I don't see it right here. So, I'll, I'll mention what Matt was talking about. Ah, uh, that didn't get into my presentation. When she had her first baby and called him Cain, Cain means two things. It means my precious little one, and it also means spear. Which seems, the indication is that she wanted her little one to spear the head of the seed of the serpent. She was mad as blankety blank at this, at what he had done to deceive her, and she wanted to get him, and she thought she had the son who was, he was, you know, the seed of the woman, and is going to is going to spear. She understood that her son would be Messiah. Instead, she got Cain. You know. Then she know. names Abel. Her theology good. Her timetable was way off. Yeah. Okay. So she actually. And that's what. So when you know, just write down that that uh, Cain means spear, and my uh, my precious one. That's what it means. So she was hoping that her precious one was Messiah. Oh my goodness, what a shocker. Okay. My mother got that kind of shock. She was an only child. And she thought it would always be so nice to have brothers and sisters to play with. And then she had the five of us that we fought like crazy with each other and she couldn't figure that out, you know. Oh, only had brothers and sisters to play with. We'd go at it, you know. And uh, you know, the same kind of realization that uh, you know Adam and Eve had with their children. Anyways, I won't ask for stories about your siblings. Now, there's this idea is carried one more place in Isaiah. It's you to, for this verse to happen, you need a virgin birth. In Isaiah 9, 6, it says, Behold, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. He's a child, he's a son. Well, here's what it says about the child and the son. The government shall be upon his shoulder. He's a ruler. And his name shall be called what? Say it with me, folks. Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now look at those names. Uh, he's wonderful. Now, by the way, in the Hebrew, the Wonderful and Counselor, okay, we take a two-minute break here. Just stretch for a minute. We